All right, friends, I am so excited for who you get to meet today. I am sitting here with my new friend, Dr. Marissa G. Franco. Um, Marissa, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. You have a new book that came out really recently, and we were just talking about this. It just hit the New York Times bestseller list, which is wild and totally deserving. I'm not all the way through it yet. I'm like taking my time and scribbling through it. But I mean, I got like just pages in and was like, we need to have Marissa on the show. So um, congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be chatting with you. So, okay, for women who who don't know who you are yet, can you tell us who you are, uh, what you do, and a fun fact about yourself? Yeah. So I am a professor, psychologist, national speaker, author of Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. My fun fact, when I was young, I actually got scuba certified and volunteered at the zoo at their like big Halloween fest to swim in the otter tank in a in a like scary, like, I don't know, creature of the dark lagoon costume and bang on the window when people pass by. Oh my, did you get scuba certified just for that purpose? <laughs> I did it, I did it. But they really capitalized on the scuba, cer- scuba certification at the zoo. That is so amazing. Um, do you, uh, both my husband and I got certified a handful of years ago and I feel like it's one of the coolest most daring things I've ever, like I never thought that I would be a scuba diving type of person. Like I don't even know that I like snorkeling, but um, (laughs) my whole family got certified and it was sort of a FOMO kind of situation. Uh, And I'm so glad because it's so cool. Like, do you still do that? Not as much because I found it very hard to equalize where you like try to to clear the the air pressure. And Mm -hmm. so I, I definitely do more, still enjoy the water so much. And I do a lot of snorkeling. Yeah. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, well, I love that. Uh, if bonus points, if you have pictures of that anywhere, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely didn't warn you of that. Um, okay, so you mentioned your book. We've talked about it a little bit. Um, tell us more about like where this book came from, like where the idea came from. Tell us more about the book. Yeah, just what's the what's the backstory for Platonic? Yeah, so in my young 20s, I went through... A breakup and I felt really bad. So to heal, I started this wellness group with my friends where we met up and we cooked and we did yoga and we meditated together. And it was so life-changing for me. Um, Beyond all the wellness, I think what was most healing was just being in community with people that I love who loved me every week. And the group really made me question some ideas that I had about love that I realized were really harming me. Uh, I felt like you know, romantic love was the love that made me worthy. And if I didn't have it, I didn't have any love in my life at all. And I looked around at these friends and I was like, well, this is still love. Like, why doesn't this count? Why doesn't this matter? And now I feel like in a lonely society, we can't really afford to throw even a morsel of connection away. And that friendship is this gold of connection under our feet, but we treat it like concrete. So I was really motivated to write Platonic because I thought, it would really benefit us all if we leveled this hierarchy that we place on love and started to see connection as valuable in whatever form it comes in in our lives. I love that. Um, Tell me why, um, and there's like several pages that I just highlighted about this, but I want to hear it from you. Why is friendship valuable? Like what mm-hmm. happens to us in our lives when we have good friends? Yeah. So you know how we focus on things like diet and exercise and doing all those things to be healthy and live a long life. Um, actually, the research on social connection finds that, that it affects how long we live more than our diet or exercise, almost like twice as much. Um, so yeah, right? It's it's really <gasps> shocking. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that I think is, is really any form of connection, right? Romantic, platonic, familial, but I think friendship has certain, there's certain reasons why friendships still really, really matter to us. I think a lot of the times we see this tension between our spouse and our friends, right? If I'm hanging out with my friends, I'm not hanging out with my spouse, but the research really shows us that having friends makes our romantic relationships better. That when we get into conflict with our, our spouse and we have friends, it doesn't, affect our stress hormone release in the same way. That 
we are more, well, women in particular, are more resilient to stress in their marriage when they have support outside the marriage. That when we make a friend, it not only makes us less depressed, but it makes our spouse less depressed. Whereas people that only rely on a spouse, they, what we see in the research is that their mental health really goes up and down with how their relationship's going with their spouse. And they're, they're not as resilient when things aren't going well, when there's this natural ebb and flow, right? And so it's a resource for us when we're getting into conflict with our spouse to be able to center ourselves by venting and getting that support outside the marriage because then we return to the marriage in a centered, loving place to be like, let's work through this conflict instead of feeling downtrodden and feeling very cynical because we don't have, we're not feeling centered by connection anymore. Yeah, that is, um, that is wild. Like it, it, it really impacts our, I guess our quality of life, but also our health that much. Yeah, it is really wild. And that's partially because like loneliness is chronic stress. Like when you're lonely, it's not just a feeling, it's a state of mind. People that are lonely, basically their brains become very vigilant for signs that they're being rejected. Because if you think about this historically, right, you're on this African savanna, you're alone, you're in danger. And so that's what your body tells you when you're lonely now. You're in danger. Look out for signs that people are going to reject you and or harm you, right? And so your body's sort of inflamed, your sleep is disrupted, your memory is disrupted. It's like living in fight or flight mode when you're feeling really lonely. And that's why it can really deteriorate our bodies over time. Okay, that is, that it's crazy. Man, I feel like I need to sit on that for a while. Is there anything, you know, I know you did so much research for this book. What was, like, what were some of the most, I mean, you might have just said them, but I'd love to hear anything that comes to mind. What were some of the most surprising things where you were like, I had no idea that friendship worked that way or, you know, it impacted us this way or that just anything that kind of caught your, caught your eye about friendship as you were doing all this research? Yeah, so Stephanie, um, do you know that the people that are most likely to reject you are actually the people that fear rejection the most? Um, people that are what's called rejection sensitive, when they, when someone interacts with them and it's sort of ambiguous, they interpret it as rejection, right? Like, I didn't hear back from you in a certain amount of time. I think you're rejecting me, right? And then they get cold and withdrawn. And maybe your friend was just hangry and you get cold and withdrawn and you actually reject people. So the more you think that you're going to be rejected, the more you get into self-defense mode where you're now rejecting everybody, right? And so that I think is one of the interesting takeaways from the book that when we think we're being rejected all the time, we're likely not being very kind or good in our relationships, right? Like people will be like, I don't reach out because they don't want to hear from me. But uh, fundamentally, how's that coming off to other people that you don't care about them, right? And so what I share in the book is that if we, to really benefit our friendships, we have to assume people like us. Because according to the, the research, when researchers told people that you're going to go to this group and they're going to like you, it was a complete lie, deception, that they found that 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 when people made that assumption, it made them warmer, friendlier, and more open. And it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's all these ways that like what we assume about the world fundamentally becomes true, not because it is true, but because it impacts our behaviors in a way that we almost manifest it to become true. Oh my gosh. That um I've used this example before in, in different settings, but like if you're afraid that you're annoying and you ask people over and over again, if you're annoying, eventually that becomes annoying. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, I feel like I do this a lot with my husband. I'll um, interpret like, you know, some piece of body language or some nonverbal cue or some tone or something as him being frustrated or in a bad mood or upset. And um, I'll ask him if he is and he'll be like, no, I'm fine. But I've, decided that that's what's true. And mm -hmm. so then I'll ask another couple of times and then eventually he is upset because I've asked him enough times. <laughs> <he's> <laughs> exactly. Upset. And it just is like, oh my gosh, I could have stopped that so much sooner. I'm working on that. I'm working on it. <laughs> um, that is so, so... So if someone is afraid of rejection, they are going to like... I mean, we, we know the thing about rejecting other people first. Like if you're afraid that a relationship is going to fail or something, like, you know, there's some, some sort of self-sabotage thing that happens. But you're saying it's even a step further than that, that 
if we are afraid we're going to be rejected, then we're going to come across as as less friendly, making exactly. it more po- like more probable that we will be. Yeah. So there's this theory called risk regulation theory, which just argues that we walk along this line between being in self-protection mode and pro-relationship mode. When we're in self-protection mode, I'm not reaching out. I'm being cold. I'm not being vulnerable. I'm not expressing affection or happiness towards you. I don't trust you, right? That that is the opposite of pro-relationship mode. And the longer we're in that mode, the more we harm our relationships, right? Not saying sometimes it isn't necessary. When you're around people that are untrustworthy, it's adaptive. But when you're in pro-relationship mode, fundamentally, you are more vulnerable. It's more of a risk, right? You're reaching out. Now you could be rejected. You're telling people you like and value them. You're being vulnerable, right? It makes rejection a higher risk. And so if you are constantly in self-protection mode, you may not be realizing it, but the consequences is that you are harming your relationships, right? Which is why I need, I think it means self-protection mode in the in the moment, but in the long run, you know, if you continue to push people away, that's causing you more harm because our relationships are the, the one of the best resources that we have to get through life. And so it requires us to switch from self-protection mode to pro-relationship mode if we want to make friends and if we want to connect with people, which is inherently risky. There's really no way of getting around that riskiness. But I think, again, the biggest risk of all is staying in your place of distrust and isolation because being isolated is what's going to harm you the most, as we talked about. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Tell me about, you know, I've heard, I've heard this phrase before, but I don't know very much about it. Um, I know that one of the big things you talk about in the book is attachment style. First of all, what is an attachment style? I feel like so many, like, we're like, Mm -hmm. I've heard, like, I can guess, but I don't know that I would guess right. So yeah, tell us, give us a rundown on attachment style. Yeah, so attachment style is basically a template you form for how people will treat you and a set of behaviors that you react to in response to those assumptions. So it forms in our early childhood, right? With our parents, how they treat us becomes our template for how the world will treat us, right? So if we're securely attached, our parents showed us that people will love us, people are trustworthy. We go into that world, the world, with these assumptions, and it facilitates us being able to connect with people in healthy ways, right? Because I, again, assuming people like you continues to benefit your relationships, right? But people that are insecurely attached, their template, their early childhood relationships were not as positive. They didn't get some fundamental needs met. And it, it could be your early child relationship. This, your attachment style can also evolve over time. So it could be not just your parents, but other relationships. And so we have anxiously attached people who learned their parents tended to be overbearing or intrusive um, and didn't, you know, weren't able to fully show up for them emotionally. And so these anxiously attached people think other people are always rejecting them and are, are going to re- abandon them, right? And like we talked about, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or like, you know, you're again, always asking people to reassure you and eventually they kind of get fed up or you're you're so afraid of rejection that you're you're almost being a little bit coercive and trying to get people to connect with you. It seems like they're not interested and you continue to, to try to text them and convince them to hang out with you, right? And fundamentally that people like to have agency to choose things in their relationships. So, so again, it becomes this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy when you think everybody's going to reject you and abandon you. But then you also have avoidantly attached people. They similarly think people will reject and abandon them. Their childhoods tended to be, you know, there was food, there was shelter, but there wasn't any emotional warmth. So they experienced a lot of emotional neglect. So what they learned was that I can't trust people and I need to handle, go through this thing called life alone. I'm going to suppress all my feelings. Other people are untrustworthy and I'm going to almost isolate myself because of that, right? And so they tend to really push people away and not invest in their relationships. And again, obviously, this could be a self-fulfilling prophecy where you think people aren't trustworthy, you're not investing in your friendships, and then you're like, well, people aren't hanging out with me, people aren't welcoming me, right? But you kind of made them feel rejected by not investing in the relationship at all. So, so yes, these are the three different attachment styles, three different sets of assumptions, and fundamentally, three different personalities, right? I, I argue in the book that our personalities are a reflection of our connection or lack thereof in the past, that whether we are warm, friendly, loving, trust, trusting, um, you know, vulnerable, all of these things are reflections of our previous relationships. And 
become embedded in part of our personalities. How do we fix this? <laughs> Oof, it's hard, <laughs> but possible. Uh, that's I, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that because people listen to me and they're like, good for those people with healthy childhoods, you know, like screw me, I guess. And um, yeah. I just want to say that, you know, actually research finds that your attachment style is in some studies is more likely to change over time than it is to stay the same. So it's totally possible to change your attachment style. And um, even knowing about your attachment style can help change it, some research finds. And, you know, what I, what I say, I think I have a few tips and in the book I get into to many, many more that we need to begin to hold our insecurities more loosely so if I think people are rejecting me or judging me, to be able to acknowledge, I think that, but I know, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's actually true. This is an ambiguous situation, right? And so it's not about never feeling insecure, but not necessarily believing <laughs> your insecurities in the same way, right? And then the other thing that I suggest, right? People with insecure attachment styles, they fundamentally just feel very unsafe in relationships. Like they feel very unsafe connecting with people. And the issue is that once you have this template formed, you then read moments of unsafety and you ignore moments of safety. And it feels like, again, whatever your assumption is, is true because anything that's counter to that truth, you don't actually receive it or take it in or acknowledge it. So I really like uh, the work of this psychologist, Rick Hansen, and he studies taking in the good, which is basically savoring experiences of safety to override your brain's tendency to focus on the opposite, experiences of threat. So when someone responds to your text message, when someone holds the door for you, when someone smiles at you, when someone shows up when they said they would, right? Pausing, he, he talks about absorbing the experience, which means focusing on it until it stirs an emotion in you, like joy, like feeling cared for, right? And then he talks about enriching it, which means visualizing that experience sinking into your body and almost becoming a part of you. And so mm -hmm. it can just be a minute when someone, you know, responds to you positively for you to actually savor it, be intentional about registering it and receiving it. Because, you know, he talks about when we do this, we release dopamine and norepinephrine in our brain, which fundamentally help change our, our brain. It ch changes, you know, our our brain is very plastic. New experiences we have can change how it's wired, right? And so if we can make this a practice of instead of always registering threat that matches our preconceived notions, we're instead going to very much focus on acknowledging safety and acknowledging acceptance. That can help us become more secure. That makes a lot of sense. I like that a lot. Um, and I also like the idea of not necessarily believing your insecurities or I'm and you know I, I like that you said hold them loosely not necessarily combat them because I think that you know if you walk into a room and you think everyone is thinking about the fact that I am tall like mm -hmm. uh, you know I'm pretty tall so okay like you know you walk into a room and everyone's thinking wow she's really tall well I mean you can try to convince yourself no like people are not thinking that or people think I'm short. Well, okay, but that's not either true or that's also hard to prove. And and so I feel like, I feel like it, it um, requires like a couple extra steps and a couple, like it allows more doubt to kind of creep in of, of um, what's actually true. But if you just throw some, some doubt into the situation period and just say, they might be thinking this, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, instead of trying to convince yourself that they're thinking the opposite. That just seems like it's a, a less of a stretch, um, but also really freeing. And and I think generally, I mean, I, there might be, there's probably uh, something to back this up. I'd love to know if there is, but the idea that most people aren't thinking about us. Yep. They're, they're thinking about themselves. Have you found anything like, you know, has there been any research or did you find anything on that? Yeah, it's called the spotlight effect. <laughs> we think we're at the center of the spotlight, but um, you know, people are focusing a lot more on themselves than us. It's like these these studies where people wore these like really silly shirts and were like, "How much do you think other people are thinking about this shirt?" And people are actually like, "I'm not. I didn't even notice that shirt <laughs> that you wore." So it's absolutely true, and something to remind yourself of, like, "Oh my gosh, I think I did something that was awful, and everybody's judging me." That 
people are judging you less than you think and people are focusing more on themselves than they are on you. And this is a science, science-backed science conclusion that I'm sharing with you. Yeah, I love that. That's so That's so helpful. Is there a way to like figure out our attachment style or is it more kind of, do you think, you know, after hearing sort of the descriptions, people are like, ah, yeah, that one's me. Yeah, I can share more of the traits and characteristics we tend to see within each attachment. So let's start with anxious. You tend to take things very personally. Um, You think you're being rejected even when you're not. That's your first assumption. You think your friends really don't like you. You can get close to people really quickly. You tend to overshare, actually, um, as a way to test people and see if they'll stick around so they won't abandon you. But your relationships tend to be a little more volatile. They move very quickly and then they kind of will blow up over time. They're just sort of a little bit more fragile because you don't necessarily give it the time to form that foundation because, again, you want that reassurance. Like, they're all in, right? Um, You struggle with conflict because you think people are going to abandon you. You won't bring up issues in friendships. And when you do, it gets to the point where you're ready to sort of attack them um, because you didn't bring it up earlier. And, you know, fundamentally, you're just really afraid in your friendships that people are going to reject you. You might not reach out as much because you think people don't care and that they're they're not really thinking about you, that they're going to reject you. You have a lot of trouble validating your own feelings. You always think the other person's right and you're wrong. Um, you When you find someone pulling away from you, you engage in what's called fawning. Fawning happens when we're threatened. We you know, there's fight, flight, freeze, and fawn, all these threat responses that we can have. And when we're fawners, when we're threatened, we try to get people to like us. We try to soften them, which means you might pursue relationships with people that aren't actually invested in you and don't tend to care for you. Um, Sometimes you engage in really unbehaviors that on the surface really help friendships, like being really generous, but you tend to be egoistic about it. So if you are generous to someone, you're like, well, what are you going to do that back for me? Like it's almost can be a little bit I don't want to say manipulative because I think, you know, anxious people are kind of generous, but they do a lot of things to feel like the other person is going to love them back instead of because they just want to express their love for someone, right? So Mm -hmm. that's anxious attachment. Um, Avoidantly attach people. You don't trust people. You feel suffocated very easily. When people try to get close to you, you pull away. You're not very vulnerable. Your friends feel like they're around you, but they don't really know you. You might have a sort of shallow, a lot of shallow friendships. You might not have that many friends. Um, You tend to ghost. You're very uncomfortable with feelings, both other people's and your own. So if other people have feelings or are vulnerable with you, you have trouble and you, you don't really express your feelings towards other people. You're just very uncomfortable with vulnerability, both other people and your own. And for other attachment styles, when people are vulnerable, they feel closer to the other person. But when people are vulnerable with you or when you're vulnerable, you feel maybe even like disgust or discomfort, right? Coming from some of your past. And so, you you know, your relationships, you tend to have fewer friendships and you don't invest in them and you don't make as much effort. And some friends might have been very frustrated with you for that, but you feel like maybe they've, they're just making a big deal and they're expecting too much and they're sensitive. Um, so you have this un, unwritten rule that everybody should just be relying on themselves and anybody who breaks that rule, you feel like you judge them, basically. And then we have securely attached people who feel they are more confident. They trust people until someone gives them a reason not to. They can be vulnerable, but if the other person isn't reciprocating, different from the anxious fawning response, they walk away. They don't work harder if someone doesn't like them. They can bring up conflict in a way that's not attacking the other person. And they engage in mutuality, which means when they address friendship issues, when they navigate their world of friendship, they're thinking about both the other person and them at the same time. And thinking about how do I solve this problem in a way that benefits both of us, right? Anxiously attached people, they're just fulfilling others' needs. They're not thinking about their own. Avoidantly attached people, they're just fulfilling their own needs, not thinking about other people's. Secure people, they're all about that sense of balance. They tend to have more long-lasting relationships. Their relationships have lasted a really long time. They're comfortable with very close relationships, but they could also have like a larger network of looser ties. So in general, I call them the super friends because they just have thriving friendships that last over time and people really enjoy being friends with them. Okay, that is, that's very helpful. So I want to go back because now like I have more 
Like, I have more questions. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think everyone's like, okay, I have more questions. So you said kind of in the beginning that your kind of perspective or your your kind of thesis on this is that our personalities are shaped by our previous re- relationships. And you said that could be our parents, but it also could be other friendships. Mm-hmm. That or kind romantic of, relationships, yeah. Okay, so we could have, you know, really healthy um you know, loving but not overbearing parents, but then go through, you know, the a breakup or have something happen with a friend or, you know, something like that in our, any time in our life and that can change our attachment style? Yes, it can. And we could also have, you know, attachment styles are very complex. We could also have different attachment styles in different relationships. I see sometimes people are, Secure in romance, insecure in friendship, or vice versa. Insecure in romance and secure in friendship too. And then fundamentally, attachment is a dynamic, right? If you have someone who is always trying to be close to you and reaching out to you all the time, you don't necessarily have time for them and they don't seem to really respect your boundaries, that anxious behavior is going to make you a little bit avoidant, logically, right? You're going to pull away and be like, okay, this is a little too much. Like, I still have other things to do. (laughs) I can't fulfill all these expectations. (laughs) And if someone's avoidant towards you where you're just like, oh, I texted you. I didn't hear back from you from it for a whole day. <laughs> or, you know, I've, I've shown interest in being your friend and I haven't necessarily gotten any of that, you know, that same energy from you. You're inevitably going to be a little bit anxious, right? And so there's this way that, yes, it's our internal template and we have a global attachment style, which means underlying attachment that tends to show up more often than not. But there's also a lot of fluidity to it. So we can have different attachment styles and different types of relationships. And even within the context of all our friendships, sometimes we can feel more anxious. Sometimes we can feel more avoidant. Okay, okay. You said that by figuring out kind of uh, what our attachment styles are in different relationships, that can be a really powerful step forward in terms of changing them. Like if we are sitting here going, wow, like I you know, have some of those avoidant tendencies or some of those anxious tendencies Figuring that out is a good step in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're, if you have insecure attachment, you're engaging in certain behaviors that prove your attachment style true. So if you know what some of those behaviors are and you change your behaviors, you're going to, your confirmation bias, your template is going to be proved false, right? If you can change your behaviors, you can change how you think about your relationships because you're going to get a different response. So that is why it's really important to know our attachment style because we stop engaging in these behaviors that kind of influence or lead to what we're most afraid of. And then we get a different sense of the world, which is what's really important for changing our attachment style. And not only that, but when we do engage in these different behaviors and we get different outcomes, That's a moment to savor and that's a moment to receive, just like I spoke about earlier, right? Actually focus on this time went different. This time I tried to address conflict and it went well and I felt closer to that person. So let me take a moment to receive that and to focus on that and to feel the joy of that in my body so that you can start making some of these changes become more hardwired in you instead of, because you know, anxious people aren't like, yeah, like I'm trying to like, I don't know, I'm trying to like, I feel like I'm doing it intentionally where I'm assuming I'm going to be rejected. It's not an intellectual experience. It's an emotional experience. It's like Mm -hmm. my body feels like it's on fire and I need someone to do something about this, right? And so I think it has to become what's called embodied in that it has to be an emotional experience of love and acceptance that you have. And taking something that's intellectual, like someone did was loving towards me or did show up for me, we have to make it emotional. We have to feel in response to that to begin to change our reactions. Okay. So the the mental picture I I just got was like baking a cake. And if we, you know, have put too much salt in and we've come out with a salty cake for years and years and years, we think every time we make a cake, it's salty. But if we can figure out, if we can like look at what we're putting in and say, hey, I think I tend to put in a little too much salt or hey, I think I tend to come on a little too strong in friendships or I tend to be really, you know, um, I tend to avoid vulnerability a lot and it makes my friendships kind of too surface level or something. Then we can be like, okay, I'm going to pull back on the salt. Exactly. And then you taste the cake and it tastes less salty. That like kind of reinforces 
it, it helps us. And then if we really sit and embody it and like really pay attention to that, that new result, that's what starts to change us moving forward. Exactly. I love that metaphor, Stephanie. And I would add to it that um, we may be putting in salt, but we think we're putting in sugar. So the difference is that if we think we're putting in sugar, we're just going to be like, screw this recipe. You know, this website sucks instead of looking at our own behavior, right? And I think that's where a lot of anxious and avoidant people end up, where they're like, people are just, people just suck. People are going to abandon you at the end of the day. People can't be trusted, right? They're making all of these external assumptions about everyone else <laughs> um, instead of looking at themselves because they have no idea that they're putting in salt instead of sugar, right? And so that's why it's so helpful to acknowledge your own salt <laughs> because then you know where to target the change, right? It's not that I'm helpless, the world is this way, but it's like, oh, I actually can influence this outcome by changing the behaviors that I'm putting in the cake. How do you know when it, like, because I, I, I love that and I love, you know, the the bravery of looking at ourselves and, and like, honestly, and, and the fact that there is so much that can change when we do that. But like, sometimes it is other people. So yeah. how do we figure out like, <laughs> is it me? Is it them? You know, I, I think for some of us, and maybe this is, I think I probably lean a little bit more towards anxious mm -hmm. than uh, avoidant. Um, and with lots of work and time, uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm much more in the secure attachment uh, space. But I think that it would be, um, I would, like my go-to probably for most of my life would be to assume that it's like my fault. Mm -hmm. So how do you find that balance between ownership and taking ownership of what's yours, but then also allowing other people to do the same? This is a great question because you're absolutely right. And the thing is, if you're anxious, you're attracted to people that mistreat you because <laughs> they give you the chance to earn love. And that's what you learn, that you have to earn love. And when it comes to you, automatically, it's suspicious, right? And so fundamentally, it's not just about your assumptions, but that your assumptions are leading you to be friends with people that actually aren't healthy. So there is something real. There is this sort of dynamic between what you believe inside and what your world tends to be. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you're avoidant, you think that people are going to suffocate you and expect too much out of you, right? And move too soon. You think that everybody's going to treat you like someone anxious, but if someone secure meets you, they're like, you're not putting in any effort into this friendship. I'm going to move on. If someone anxious meets you and they're like, oh, you're not putting in any effort. Let me try harder. That you're fundamentally <laughs> going to invite these anxious people into your life. And so there's this way that what our assumptions are is bridged into reality, right? And I think being able to understand that requires us to think on two planes and two dimensions. And that is emotionally and intellectually about a situation. So if you're anxiously attached, again, you know, Stephanie, you mentioned feeling like it's always your fault and you're always the one doing things wrong, right? And that is common with people that are anxiously attached. You know, they're very uncomfortable with their own anger and they don't validate their own feelings, right? And so they don't know what truth is because when their body is telling them this isn't all right, they're kind of just pushing it away. Um, so it, it takes being able to validate your own feelings and say, oh, I'm upset about this. I'm angry about this. Let me look at that instead of let me just assume it's, it's my own fault, Right. And so being able to acknowledge your feelings and wonder about what they're telling you, but also engaging intellectually in this exercise, right? So it's like, okay, I didn't hear back from my friend in three hours. My body feels like it's on fire. I acknowledge that. This really hurts me. I'm feeling so rejected. But when I also bring in the intellectual piece, my friend haven't responded to me in three hours. Do I think that that is a harmful behavior, <laughs> right? You might say, well, not necessarily. You know, I know that this friend could be busy. There could be something going on. And so it's being able to acknowledge the information on both sides to come up with a greater sense of truth. And, you know, I think the issue with anxiously attached people is for securely attached people, they can use their feelings more so as guides for whether someone is treating them okay or negatively, right? But for anxiously attached people, they've so ignored their own feelings and invalidated their own feelings that their feelings have begun to become more extreme <laughs> because they're like, you need to acknowledge me. You need to <laughs> acknowledge that you're, you know, you're, you feel bad and you're being rejected, right? And so it becomes harder to 
understand what's truth and what's, you know, me reacting based on my history and feeling very triggered in this moment, right? But it, once we continue anxiously attached people, continue to validate their feelings over time and, and learn that ability to, to soothe their own emotions, which requires validating your feelings and tolerating that discomfort instead of trying to, to handle it by controlling other people, right? Then they're going to be able to, to feel the, the more truth behind their emotions, right? Their emotions are going to become recalibrated um, so that they can begin to, to rely more on their emotions to tell them when something is, is going wrong or right in a relationship. Yeah, there's so much to that. I'm like, I need to sit with that for a while. Um, I do remember there was one day where a friend of mine told me, Stephanie, your emotions aren't always true or like aren't always telling you telling you the truth. And I'm like, I mean, it was like, what do you, what? What do, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> it's a really hard thing. It's a, it's a hard thing to get your heart and your mind and everything that's happening around you, like to work together, I it guess. It really is. Yeah. And you know, I think mm, insecurely attached people get triggered by relationships. And my reflections on triggers is that they're kind of the opposite of love because they cause us to reduce someone to what they did to make us feel triggered. And love is seeing someone expansively and seeing someone very fully for who they are and giving them the benefit of the doubt. Whereas when we're triggered, we are, we do the opposite, right? We, we assume that this one behavior that they did means that they're like an awful human, right? And so I think we can be more responsible about our triggers by first of all thinking, am I reacting more strongly to this situation than the average person might, right? Because then there might be more to this. It might not just be what they're doing to me, but what this triggers about my history, what this triggers about similar experiences that I've had before. And I'm experiencing all that emotion cumulatively right now. And so I think emotions are helpful. They provide information, but they're not the be all end all. And it requires us to engage in self-reflection. Like this emotion is a signal. What is it signaling? Is it signaling that someone is treating you negatively right now? Or is it signaling this experience reminds you of an earlier experience where someone really did cause a lot of harm to you? Yeah. I'm so glad that we're talking about this. Um, I've talked about this on the show several times. I First of all, I love therapy. Just I'm such a huge... I know I told you at the beginning, um, but both my parents are licensed psychologists and uh, I just... It's it's just this incredible therapy's been this incredible resource for me throughout several different seasons of life. But in the last couple of years, one of the things that I've spent a lot of time talking about is friendship. And I think it's because I was seeing, I was having a lot of anxiety surrounding my friendships. And I'm like, where does this come from? Like my friendships, especially now in the last, you know, 10 years or so, are are like deep and true and lasting and um, really healthy. Like I have just really, really good friends, but I haven't always. And so there are things where, you know, I, I would find myself reacting more strongly to, you know, a situation or, or having a lot of fears that had nothing to do with the actual relationship at hand. And and that was one of the things that I spent a lot of time talking about in therapy. Like, why am I reacting this way? Um, and how do I stop reacting this way? Because uh, it was because I could see it harming my friendships, or at least harming me. You know, there just was mm. there was so much swirling in me, whether or not it like made it out to my like you know, even if I was able to protect my friends from it, it still was happening within me, and and it made life really hard. And and so I was really grateful for that help. It is super painful. It feels it can feel like you're just like an open nerve trying to navigate relationships. Yes, yes. Um. So I want to like. One of the things that I know we're dealing with, especially as adults, and I would love to know any anything you know about this, but one of the things that we're dealing with is that we don't have as many friends as we would like to have. Tell me anything you know about like quantity of relationships, you know, maybe over time or, you know, what is normal or what's best for us. And then how do we, a, a, any advice you have for making new friends? Yeah. So what is normal changes throughout our lifespan. In our 20s, young 20s, we tend to have the most friends. We also tend to be friends with people that mm, are, are more looser connections. They're kind of different from us. And that's because in, in that time, in that age, we're really seeking to expand our sense of self, right? It, figure out our identities. So interacting with all these different types of friends really helps us experiment with different identities for ourselves. But 
over time, what happens is we get older, we think about, we start thinking about how much time do I have left? And then I really want to spend it with people I feel really close to, with those deep quality connections. So as we're older, we tend to shed friendships and focus more on quality over quantity. And that actually benefits us. Our, we tend to experience more satisfaction in our friendships when that happens. But, you know, that's just because our priorities and values differ depending on our age. So again, what's appropriate or what we might enjoy in our friendships can really change over time. And it's normal for that to happen. It's also normal for friends to ebb and flow and come and go across the lifespan. Every seven years, one study found we lose half our friends. So expect that there's going to be people that you thought were going to be in your life forever that are not going to be and that you're not the only one going through that. And a lot of people are going through that, right? But what that mm-hmm. means, if, if, it, if in every seven years we lose half our friends, we better learn how to make friends, right? Because even if it's not happening now, it's, it might happen in the next seven years. <laughs> and so what I want to tell people to really make friends, first of all, I want to disabuse people of the idea that friendships happen organically. Because in adulthood, a lot of the times they don't. Um, You know, when we're children, we have what sociologist Rebecca Adams calls the essential ingredients for organic friendship, continuous unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability. That's cool. Gym, recess, lunch. But as adults, I mean, we might see our colleagues every day, but we're not necessarily being vulnerable with them. Like these norms around professionalism mean that we're not being vulnerable And we don't have the same infrastructure for friendship. So if we rely on that same same concept of how friendship works in adulthood, we're going to be lonely, right? And this is, you know, backed by one study that found that people that see friendship as based on luck are lonelier over time, whereas those that see it happening based on effort are less lonely over time. So you have to try. (laughs) You have to initiate. Like, don't just wait for people to come to you. Don't be passive about this, the one of the most important things in your life for your mental health, for your physical health, for your sense of who you are. Like, don't just like wait. Don't just wait. Like, you're going to have to initiate. I know that's scary, but I've told you, assume people like you. I've told you about the liking gap. People are less likely to reject you than you think. So if you want to make your first friend, two paths that I suggest. One, reaching out to people to reconnect right? A lot of us have people we'd love to have stayed connected to, but we didn't just because we got busy. And the research finds that when we send that text to reconnect, people like it more than we think. They appreciate it more than we assume, right? And so you may be thinking they don't want to hear from me, but from the research, they're probably more likely to want to hear from you than you think. Mm -hmm. Um, But the other way that I would say is joining a hobby that you can pursue in community that's repeated over time because this capitalizes on something called the mere exposure effect, which is our tendency to like people the more we've been exposed to them. It's completely unconscious. These researchers had people in a psychology lecture and they planted women into the psychology lecture and they found at the end of the semester, people liked the woman that showed up to the most lectures 20% more than the woman that didn't show up for any. But nobody remembered any of these women. So it's completely unconscious, right? Um. Yeah, it's wild. So so yeah, what that tells us is when we first interact with people, mere exposure hasn't set in. We're going to be weary. It's going to be awkward. We're going to be mistrusting, right? That's not a sign that, oh, I need to jump ship. I shouldn't be part of this group anymore. It's a sign that you're, hey, you're part of the trajectory of friendship, right? That's the first stage. Awkward, weary, you know, hard, difficult, right? And then trusting that, oh, but it will get easier over time. Mere exposure effect will set in. I'll like them more. They'll like me more. But not only that, when you become part of this social group, right? Some of us, you've overcome something called overt avoidance, which is our tendency to avoid interaction because we're scared. But you might still be engaging in something called covert avoidance, which is our tendency to show up physically, but check out mentally, right? And that looks like I join this, you know, hiking group or this walking club, but I'm always on my phone or I'm talking to the one person that I already know, right? So you have to overcome that covert avoidance by saying to someone, hey, you know, my name's Marissa. How have you liked this group? Like showing interest in other people. I think often we have this misconception that to be likable, I need to be funny. I need to be smart. I need to be charismatic, right? But in fact, people report that that's the least important trait in friends, someone who's entertaining. The most important they value is someone who makes them feel valued and makes them feel like they matter. So theory of inferred attraction, throwing out this jargon. It's basically the idea that people like people that they think like them. 
So if you want to make friends, it's about making other people feel loved and making other people feel like they belong. This is so that I'm just, my mind is blown because these are so many things that like, I, like that I've, I've wondered about or I've thought, I thought were true or, or, you know, I think I see, I might see a pattern here and you're like, nope, that's real and scientifically <laughs> proven. I'm just, I'm fascinated. Uh, I'm about to go do so much reading after this. You said something back when, when you were first talking about making new friends and you said something about a gap but I didn't mm-hmm. recognize that phrase. Tell me that, explain that to us one more time. Yeah, it's called the liking gap. And it's the finding that when people interact with someone and predict how liked they are, people underestimate how liked they are. Okay, okay. Man, that's crazy. It's crazy. Um, it really, all of this is, it really is pointing to the fact that we really are our own worst critics. Yeah. And And we really, I mean, it's like if there are two, if we could do a side-by-side comparison, like a TV show or something of what a scenario looks like through our eyes and then what it looks like through someone else's eyes, like it really, our version should be like dark and grainy and have like, you know, <laughs> sad, mean music. If music could be mean, you know, uh, and everyone else is like, I think that went great. Yeah, um, right. It's like we're all like have this horror movie running in our heads for how totally. life is going. Totally. And everyone else is like, no, I thought it was great. Um, (laughs) Okay. So tell me more. um, So that's making new friends. Any tips for going deeper with our friends? Because I know like I've been in situations where I, you know, I have a lot of people around and I'm still lonely. I think a lot of us have felt that. So, so what about that? Yeah. Great question. So loneliness comes from not having the social connection you want which can come from being isolated from people. But I also see inauthenticity as a form of loneliness. When you feel like you can't be your authentic self around people. And it's really those quality connections that protect us against loneliness the most. Not just being around people, but feeling that, that depth and that sense of being really understood. And I think one of the best ways to do this in friendship is to just let ourselves be a little bit more vulnerable, right? Like we have this misconception that vulnerability makes us weak or people will exploit us when we're vulnerable, use it against us, right? But in fact, the research finds that when people are more vulnerable, they're liked more. And that, again, this negativity bias called the beautiful mess effect, that when people judge other people's vulnerability, they see it pretty positively, but when they judge their own, they see it negatively. (laughs) So again, we're mispredicting the value of vulnerability. But people that are more vulnerable too, like the people that express negative emotions actually make more friends over time, which is interesting. Um, And so I think bringing a little bit more vulnerability, like sharing a little bit about like what you're struggling with, if you've been interacting with someone for a while, but don't feel like you've actually like gotten to know them. I think that can be really important and really bonding. I will say the other thing that I suggest is expressing affection for people and showing them that you like and value them. The reason being that when people decide, according to to risk regulation theory, which I, I mentioned earlier, we decide how much to invest in a relationship based on our prediction of how likely we are to get rejected. So if we think we'll be rejected, we're not gonna invest. When you express affection towards someone and you tell them how great they are, right? Which I have tried to do more often. Um, Just tell people, I like, you know, you have great energy. I really enjoy this conversation because according to the research, again, people appreciate that more than we think and it's less awkward than we think, right? What you're telling them is you're not going to be rejected if you try to invest here, right? And that that fear of rejection is, yeah, one of the biggest barriers to friendship. So the more that you can convey that people won't be rejected when they interact with you, the more that they are going to want to invest in a deeper friendship with you. You're a safe person. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's really beautiful. There's seriously, there's so much. I'm like, I'm going to have to go listen through this again and again. Um, I want to ask you just one more uh, big thing before we close out. You know, I think we all have this, idea of, you know, when we're, when we're imagining what our ideal friendship scenarios are, I think for a lot of us, we're imagining or hoping for lifelong friends. Do you have any um, tips or any, is there any research on 
not duration of friendships necessarily, but like how to how to make a friendship last. Yeah, this is a great um, question. I think <laughs> I think about defining friendship and how important that is because I think sometimes our view on friendship to me is is good company and not a good friend. Good company to me is someone whose company I enjoy. I like them as a person. But that is not a good friend. A friendship is an investment and it is a commitment to another person. If I'm a good friend or to someone, if they're a good friend to me, I'm showing up in their times of need. I'm trying to support them. I'm rooting for them to succeed, right? I'm trying to help them live a better life, right? I'm I'm trying to be a steward for them living the life that they really want. I'm trying not to judge them when they have a concern. I'm open to figuring out how I can get their needs met while also attending to my own, of course. So it's an investment and it's a commitment, right? And I think if we think friendship is just good company, we're not going to um, initiate. We're not going to invest. We're not going to make an effort, right? And fundamentally, our friendships are going to reflect that, right? Like people aren't going to feel as close to us. We're not going to feel as close to them. It's work, right? I am I am implying that friendship is work. I also am implying that friendship is absolutely worth it and it's going to change your life and it's going to feel beautiful and meaningful and profound and that if you, as someone who, do, don't, who doesn't have friends and thinks you don't need them, that we have this other bias wherein when we predict how much, how good friendship feels before we're actually engaging with that relationship, we tend to underestimate how much we'll benefit of, from it and how much joy we'll have from it. So I would suggest that we have this sense of friendship that requires effort, that requires investment, that requires intentionality. Instead of just seeing it as good vibes only, always easy, taking no work, right? Because imagine if you had that script for your for your marriage, right? Like how far would it go? How long it would last, right? And so bringing like three some, dates, maybe. Three, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, you're not calling me back. And I, okay, goodbye. Um, anyway, um, so that I think that's that, that desire, that commitment, that mindset, I think is really key for keeping our friendships over time. Yeah, yeah. Really like that. Um, Marissa, do you have just any last encouragement for women who are sitting here going, like, I I want this. Um, I'm still feeling intimidated. I'm still feeling overwhelmed, but I want this. Um, I'd love just any last encouragement you have for them. Yeah. So my niece told me when she read the book, Angelica, she said, for friendship to happen, someone has to be brave. So be brave. love that. Thank you so much for for the work that you've done. This is profound. This is important. This is life-changing, honestly. Um, And just really thanks for making the time to come on the show. I appreciate it. It was my pleasure, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me. 